From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It's 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day on Tuesday, February 15th. Here are the top market stories we are following for you at this hour. Pushing for a pullback. Russian President Vladimir Putin says a decision for a partial troop pullback has been made during a meeting with Germany's Olaf Scholz. NATO waits for the evidence, but the oil market doesn't. And crude craters. It's still hot in here. January producer price inflation shoots past estimates after last week's upside CPI surprise. Stocks don't seem to mind as the morning rebound sticks, but bond yields keep climbing. And putting money to work. How do you invest amid geopolitical and inflation risk? We'll get the view on the opportunities in credit and private markets with Jonathan Levine of Bain Capital and Alyssa Wood of KKR. From New York, I'm Kaylee Lines with Guy Johnson in London. Alex Steele is off today. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Guy, it's a new day. The headlines are bitter, better and the risk assets are rallying as a result. I, I think comparing and contrasting those first two headlines that you brought up, Kaylee, are, is really interesting. Mm. I, inflation, the second headline, quantifiable. We can figure that out. That's risk. The market can look at that and say, if we get this outcome, we do this. If we get that outcome, we do that. Russia, Ukraine, I think is really difficult and it's uncertainty. And at the moment, it seems if the market is basically just pricing risk on, risk off, war on, war off, because war in Europe is totally unquantifiable, lots of uncertainty. So our question of the day kind of tries to address this. Is Russian risk overpriced? I don't understand the answer to that. Uh, I, I, I don't even, in some ways, understand the question. Uh, I know that it was one that we created. But nevertheless, <laughs> trying to figure this one out, I think, is really difficult for the markets right now. So let's try and kick it around a little bit. Bloomberg's Vincent Signorella joining us. Bloomberg's Damien Sasser from Bloomberg Intelligence joining us as well. Damien, it, it, it really is fascinating at the moment watching these two big, big themes kind of play out. You've got inflation on one hand. We saw the PPI data today significantly hotter than anticipated. The market's seeing that as rearview mirror stuff, but nevertheless understands the implications of it. It's already kind of factored into the thinking. Russia, Ukraine, no idea. Yeah. How do you price in? How do you have any idea of certainty to price in risk around war in Europe? when once it starts, we have no idea how it ends. Well, Guy, I, think, I, I mean, quite honestly, you, you, you said it, you hit the nail on the head in the sense that how, what are we really talking about in terms of Russia risk? Well, we, I guess we're talking about two assets, really. We're talking about five-year credit default swaps, and we're talking about the Russian ruble. Now, if you look at the Russian ruble, certainly commodity prices, which are up, I think the Bloomberg Commodity Index is up something on the order of 11% year-to-date, the best start on record since 1993. Yeah, the ruble has obviously not kept pace with that, so many will argue that, you know, perhaps the ruble has some upside here. And certainly, if you look at five-year CDS, I mean, we're wider by 80% year-to-date. So again, I mean, very stretched levels. But don't ask me to be a Russia bull here, guy. I mean, I am a bear. I think that there's a lot of risk overhang. It's a very binary outcome, certainly in, in Ukraine. But for me, it's just very, very difficult to justify uh, taking the plunge either on the ruble or in Russian dollar credit. Russian dollar credit's off 8.5% year-to-date. Yeah, there's some room for snapback, but we're, uh, we're omitting everything like Fed rate hikes and right. tightening and all of that that goes hand-in-hand hand with it. So, yeah. Well, and Vince, this hasn't just been limited to Russian assets. It's affected equities really globally. It's affected bond markets globally as well. You've seen some of that haven bid coming in, not necessarily today. Have global markets overreacted to something that could mostly impact Russia exclusively? I don't think so. I don't think you're talking about Russia exclusively. I think this is very much a global issue. Um, and the traders, uh, this is a day trader's dream is what's going on in the markets the, uh, in the last week or so uh, regarding the Ukrainian situation. But the headlines came out yesterday um, that made it sound like Zelensky was calling uh uh, uh, calling a Russian invasion tomorrow. Then it turns out he was just being sarcastic and, and the market swung both ways violently. So I, I think we're going to see more of this. Uh, we're nowhere near uh, an agreement yet. We've yet to see what kind of true pullback Russia is going to have on the border whether it be substantial or whether it's going to be anything at all. And if it's just not lip service, we still have the vote on the Minsk Accords, which could be 
potentially uh, a, a, a lever to ratchet up uh, tensions once again. So there's, there's a lot out there. And the answer to the question that you created this morning is realistically, there's no way to trade this risk <laughs> other than for a day trader's perspective and to just jump in and out of stuff. But looking at this as a long-term long -term trade, it's really, really impossible to, to bet against. Well, Vince, let's just pick up that point. It strikes me that the, the worst case scenario for the markets in a slightly perverse way, because this is, this is a weird world that we live in, would be no conflict, because then we'd end up with continuing uncertainty. Were we to get conflict, we would start to understand what we're looking at. Positions would crystallise, and then you could start to make objective decisions on what is happening and manage that risk. You could quantify the risk. The, un the ongoing uncertainty, to my mind, strikes me as being the biggest risk for markets at this point, because as NATO Secretary General pointed out today, things could change. We could see war happening kind of overnight, but we don't know when it's going to happen, and therefore we'd be left in limbo. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty strange way to look at it, you would think, from, from a layperson's term, but from a trader's perspective, it, it, is, it is very, very accurate. I mean, if, if there would be a conflict, if it would break out tomorrow, markets would move, uh, they most likely would overreact to some extent and then come back closer to a, a mean, if you would. Uh, but yeah, traders would then, and markets and investors would have a feel as to where they need to be, at least for the coming months, as opposed to looking at this on a day-to-day -day basis which is what we're doing now, because you can't look at this more than even on a 48 hour basis, because as you just mentioned, things can change in a heartbeat overnight. They can change in the next 20 minutes for all we know. I mean, one <laughs> statement, one statement would right. move these markets. The White House just made a statement that basically said, if they cross this border, we're coming, you know, big sanctions are coming your way. So we're still talking tough here in the U.S., and, yeah. and 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 there's no there's no resolution yet. There's no there's not even a suggestion of a resolution yet. So I believe what Vince is describing is essentially the definition of headline <laughs> risk, Damien. And maybe that's going <laughs> to going to stick around for a while. Talk to me about specifically commodities, because that's actually where we're seeing the most decisive reaction today. Oil prices absolutely cratering, and Russia is especially especially sensitive to that. How does that factor into your thinking? Well, you're talking about one of the world's largest oil producers right. potentially invading one of the world's largest wheat producers. So the commodity complex is in utter disarray. And commodity, I mean, if you look at roll yield, I mean, basically every major commodity market, everyone except maybe precious metals are in backwardation, meaning you get paid to carry further out along the curve. That roll yield is significant. So from a commodity perspective, I completely agree with you. But in Russia, let's just take a step back. When in doubt, look at the fundamentals. The fundamentals in Russia are healthy, but my goodness, pro-inflationary risks are rising. If you look at you know, uh, the Central Bank of Russia, they hiked last month. We expect another 100 basis points in March, another 50 basis points in April. I mean, unemployment's at an all-time low. The economy is running red hot. So if you want to talk about putting money into Russia, you're not going to put it into Russia local denominated debt. I can assure you of that, Kaylee. Damien, just in terms of which asset classes you're looking at to get the clearest indication of how the market is perceiving this risk, what, what are they? Well, we're all looking to find out where terminal, uh, terminal rates are going to come in in emerging markets because they were the first ones to move. So if you look at Brazil, Chile, Peru, the Czech Republic, all of these markets where they were the first ones to start hiking rates, their currencies are actually some of the best performers year to date. In fact, the Bloomberg Emerging Market Local Government Bond Index is actually up year to date. Go figure, it's actually up 0.1% year to date. It's the best start since 2019, guy. So look, you know, emerging market, uh, you know, practitioners like myself are probably, you know, uh, cheering that. But at, at the same time, you know, you probably are looking for opportunities to receive in the front end of these curves. Places like Brazil stand out to me. Um, you know, the curve is you know, incredibly flat. And I, I, would, I would argue that perhaps, you know, a steepener and maybe twos, fives probably makes sense here. Well, talking about curves, let's talk about here in the U.S., Vince, because obviously we got that hotter inflation data. Guy talked about that. That was kind of a known risk to these markets is higher inflation. Can you hedge against higher inflation and hedge against geopolitical risk at the same time? A little difficult because what you would be thinking is if you would, you know, the classic hedge against inflation is to short treasuries. But again, the other side of the coin is uh, the classic hedge 
to, uh, for geopolitical, geopolitical risk, excuse me, is to buy treasuries. I think you have to look at a little bit of a of, of a mix. I mean, one of the ways you might be able to hedge this, and it looks like the markets are, are taking a punt at it right now, is to buy dollars. Um, in in two ways to see this, I think the dollar is the safest place to be in terms of looking at this. Number one, if you get inflation, you get higher rates. As long as real rates maintain mm -hmm. uh, the levels, you would get a higher dollar. The other side of the coin is with geopolitical risk if there is a, a substantial one um, people will buy dollars uh, as a haven so in a way it's the you know the the little ugly sister you get to pick um, it's it's not maybe your favorite choice but it's uh, yeah. it's the, it's the best choice maybe in this type of environment Damien there's one way to, to hedge against the, against this risk just to get a get out of the way do you think money <laughs> moves away from from Central and Eastern Europe? Does it move away from Russia? Are we seeing flows moving towards other parts of the emerging market complex? Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely you are. I mean, Latin America has been a darling. And a lot of the commodity-producing currencies, Brazil, Chile, Peru, we mentioned them all, South Africa, you know, they're some of the best-performing equity markets year-to-date, Nigeria, for example. But look, you know, again, taking a step back, again, Kelly pointed it out earlier, commodities are up 11% year-to-date. On the flip side of that, the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Bond Index down 3.5% year-to-date. That's the worst start on record ever, guys. So, you know, yeah, there is some sense of, you know, you don't, go to, you don't want to go to bonds to hide out, but I can actually justify investing in fixed income because you're going to get a positive total return potentially through the end of this year, given the sell-off we've seen already. All right, Damian Sassauer of Bloomberg Intelligence and Vince Signorella of Bloomberg News. Always great stuff. Thank you both so much. Now coming up, the money manager whose hedge fund soared 31% in January. We'll have more on the question of the day with Saeed Haidar, founder and chief investment officer of Haidar Capital Management. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First Word News. I'm Ritika Gupta. Russia has announced that some of those troops involved in drills have started returning to their bases. The military exercises had raised U.S. and European concerns about a possible attack on Ukraine. Still, NATO says it has yet to see evidence of a pullback from the Ukrainian border. The Kremlin has denied it is planning an attack. Demonstrators against vaccine mandates halted traffic at two major border crossings in Western Canada. Some vowed to stay even as Prime Minister Justin Trudeau used a law giving his government emergency powers to end the blockades. The main border posts in Alberta and Manitoba have been closed. Commercial traffic to the U.S. was blocked by semi-trailers and farm equipment. The European Union's top diplomat says he strongly believes a nuclear agreement with Iran is, quote, in sight. Joseph Borrell urged global powers to reach a compromise. Iran's foreign minister warned the U.S. and other Western powers to show their true intentions by removing sanctions on Iran's economy. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Kaylee. Ritika, thank you. Let's get back to Ritika's first story on the geopolitical tension surrounding Ukraine and the market implications. It brings us back to our question of the day, which is Russian risk overpriced? Guy and I made the question. We're not entirely sure what it means or what the answer is. So to help us answer that is Saeed Haider, founder and CIO of Haider Capital Management. He has $1.78 billion under management. His fund soared 31% in January and had a return of almost 70% last year. So Saeed, first of all, congratulations Congratulations on an excellent performance. As you look at this risk in particular, when it comes to geopolitics, how do you play it and how has it been played so far, maybe or maybe not been overdone? Well, I think that um, there was certainly risk premium being priced into um, Russian assets like the ruble and MSCI uh, Russia stock index, for example, that we follow um, from, uh, say, mid-December until late January. And then both of those markets have rallied significantly as people, um, you know, kind of faded the whole Russian risk premium move, right, and bought rubles back for yield and stuff like that. And if you look at other assets like Euro Poland, where the Polish Lottie's actually been appreciating against the Euro, it did sell off a little on Friday at late afternoon when it was untradeable and a little bit more a little yesterday, but, you know, it's rallying right back to, to new highs against the Euro. So, 
I don't think there's huge evidence that a massive amount of risk premiums been priced into Russian assets. We can point to a few assets that have been, you know, have gone up significantly, like Palladium, since mid December. Uh, they're off today a little, but um, you know, and you might think that that's evidence of a risk premium. But I think in general, in markets, until a few days ago, most investors had a very low weight priced on the chance of an actual Russian incursion, major incursion yep. in deep Ukraine. So you, six weeks ago, not many investors had really factored in the idea that the Fed was going to be aggressively raising interest rates. The last six weeks have seen, obviously, significant repositioning around that. It's a quantifiable risk. But talk to me about how your thinking has evolved. Well, I think, you know, we're seeing what we what we anticipated, but which you can't necessarily position for, you know, completely in advance, which is that we're finally starting to see the Fed realize, you know, that the labor market is too hot. They're going to have to raise rates, you know, more than, you know, they're not going to raise rates three times the market's pricing, more like six. Um, but so far, all the market has done is move the rate hikes forward. They really haven't raised the total number of hikes at all, hardly. So it's kind of odd. And this, we're seeing the same thing around the world in various markets. People think that the you know, as soon as the bond, there's a lot of bond traders, for example, think as soon as the Fed gets rates to 175, there'll be a recession mm. and the Fed will immediately backtrack. Um, we have a different view of it. If you look at inflation, it started to really move higher uh, last spring, um, not only because of base effects, but on higher frequency basis, it went up. And that was as U.S. unemployment dropped below, you know, 7 percent and through 6 percent. Right. We're now at 4 percent. We're probably going towards the low threes. Um that acceleration in inflation as unemployment dropped below six or six and a half might indicate that the non-inflationary rate of unemployment is more like six or six and a half. And that means mm. that we're going to have an incredibly tight labor market and the Fed is going to have to hike rates okay. far more than the market's pricing in still. OK, so maybe the terminal rate is going to be higher than anticipated. But let's just talk about liftoff for City uh, out publishing after PPI saying 50 basis points is going to have to be the move. Do you agree with that? I think that, OK, I think the Fed has a short period of time um, before the blackout period to really, really hit back against that. We've seen a few Fed officials push back a little on it, but not very hard. And the major people haven't pushed back against it. So unless they start a concerted campaign to push back very hard against it and push back market expectations, they are yep. going to be boxed into going 50. And I think the political situation in the U.S. has also changed dramatically where there's now political pressure on the okay. Fed to actually start to do something. So I think they're going to go 50 and then they might even do another 50 after that. But they're going to go in um, they're going to go in March, May and June. And I think they're going to go 50 uh, in March unless we see, you know, so Governor you, Waller yeah. and other people coming that, out really aggressively against it. So what I think is interesting about what you just said is is not the first 50, but the second 50. And the danger, from, presumably from a Fed's point of view, is that they go 50, the market will then extrapolate in bigger incre increments. Is that likely, do you think, to happen? Well, I think if they go 50, right, there'll be people who will start to price more than 25 for May as well. And then it'll depend on the data. But so far, you know, the Fed's been dead wrong on inflation. They've waited a year longer than they should have to end like bond buying. They're still buying bonds today. They can't explain why. <laughs> and they haven't done any hikes at all yet. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're really far behind the curve. You know, the correct thing to do is if you think your rate should be today already, you know, at like one and a half percent, maybe they should just hike to one and a half right away, but they're never going to do that. But, yeah. you know, I think the market is going to start pushing them and the dollar has not been acting very well. Um, the dollar has, you know, been weakening against a lot of other currencies, um, you know, so it also indicates, I think, that the Fed really needs to get rates higher faster, in my opinion. And if they move aggressively, how ugly could it get for credit, Saeed? Well, my guess is that credit, well, so credit spreads are tight, you know, whether you look in uh, around the world, whether you look in Euro US or Europe, um, a lot of that has to do with the mass massive amount of QE um, that's pushed down yields around the world and forced people into credit assets, right? So credit could definitely widen. There's companies that have been getting refinanced who in a normal credit market probably couldn't get refinancing. 
And some of those companies may have more difficulty getting financing eventually as well, yeah. which means eventually you're going to see default rates also rise a little. A, a little, sorry. Are we just going to get defaults Moderately. rising a little or are we going to get a proper, a proper credit cycle here? <laughs> you know, let's say I, I, I think that they, they have room to widen, but how much wider or how aggressively, you know, that's difficult to say. The thing you have to keep in mind is that the Fed hikes rates, let's say this year, by the end of this year to one and a half percent. Okay. I still think that's a very accommodative Fed funds rate, given we have inflation above 7%. And so that means that it's not like we're slowing the economy down. We're just starting to, maybe we're, we're, we're going to keep it from, you know, growing at a, at a crazy rate, but we're not like putting into recession, I don't think by putting rates up to one and a half percent. I think we have to get rates up, you know, into a restrictive territory eventually uh, because we're gonna have to get unemployment higher. And given how low unemployment is gonna get here, it's gonna be difficult to avoid a recession ultimately. But the recession isn't gonna happen this year unless the Fed does a much more aggressive hiking cycle than I think they will. Um, you know, it's probably, won't be for a couple more years based on the way the Fed's talking. So, you know, it all depends on how much they hike. But I think the Fed's yep. going to have to get rates up, you know, a lot more than the market prices. And then eventually you will get a softening economy and a recession. So the credit cycle, you don't want to be too early, too aggressively. I mean, you might want to be betting on credit widening here and mortgage and MBS widening as well. But because um, the Fed may start active sales yep. at MBS at some point. But I don't think you want to. Um, you know, go all in yet. Timing is everything. Saeed, thank you very much indeed. Really appreciate your time. Really interesting stuff. Thank you, Saeed Haider, founder and chief investment officer of Haider Capital Management. This is Bloomberg. Geopolitics and inflation front and center for the markets today on the geopolitics front. Some better sign, signs out of Russia with a troop pullback or a partial troop pullback maybe in the cards. That is lifting equities. The Nasdaq 100 up one and a half percent here in the U.S., but it is dragging down oil. WTI is down about four and a quarter percent, taking energy down with it. That sector down about two and a quarter percent. At the same time, hot PPI data coming through in the U.S. guy that is lifting Treasury yields up four and a half basis points to 2.03 percent on the 10 year. Something else for the Fed to think about. Something else for the credit market to be thinking about as well. We need to talk about repricing central bank risk and how the credit markets are dealing with that. Uh, we have an exclusive interview coming up. We'll approach this with the CIO of Bain Capital Credit, Jonathan Levine. This is Bloomberg. It's been an hour since the U.S. trading open. A rebound is underway, and Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is tracking all of the moves. Abigail? Well, Kelly, it really is a relief rally, rebound kind of day. We do have nice gains for the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq, and most major averages. This, of course, after three down days and lots of volatility. But right now, the S&P 500 heading to its best day in more than two weeks on a 1.3% gain, supported by that VIX or that volatility index, that fear gauge uh, down now at, uh, actually, this is the VIX in, the Nasdaq 100 uh, volatility gauge, now down uh, at 31, which is off of its highs, the VIX off of its uh, 30 highs, and then the 10-year yield higher, telling you that Haven bonds are selling off. So clearly we have this relief rally around geopolitical tensions easing to some degree. This is also showing in the oil market. Oil down sharply on the session, in fact, headed to its worst day of the year, down 4.2 percent, the worst day since late November. Uh, of course, when the geopolitical tensions tend to rise, oil spikes, but at this point we now have oil easing off of that $95 a barrel mark from yesterday, its highest level since 2014. And and then really supporting this idea that there's a risk on rebound uh, relief rally happening on the day. The travel trade is in full swing. Take a look at American Airlines up nearly 6%. United is up 6%. The cruisers, they are also sharply higher. However, there are always cracks to take a look at and one that a lot of people have been focusing on recently, credit. Let's give it some perspective by taking a look at a long-term uh, chart of the S&P 500 versus uh, a corporate credit spread. And what we're looking at here is in white, uh, the S&P 500 
500. In blue, a corporate credit spread. And you can see back in the financial crisis, the S&P 500, you can barely see its big gain at that time. But you can see its decline as credit spreads went very wide as investors shunned risk. Well, we, of course, right now are looking at a pretty wide divide. Not so long ago, this credit spread at an all-time tight, but coming back up off of the median level of the lows of the last several uh, decades. The S&P 500 near that record. Guy, really, you have to wonder if credit spreads continue to widen, uh, if that suggests that there could be some sort of a real systemic issue ahead. Really a big divide there that at some point suggests that we could see some sort of a reckoning. Okay. That got apocalyptic fairly quickly. Uh, <laughs> Abigail, thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle uh, on what's happening in the markets today. Um, let's, let's continue the conversation. The Fed, the Bank of England, the ECB, all changing the game for credit investors significantly over the last few weeks. Uh, we've seen a significant repricing of central bank risk. What does this mean going forward from here? Well, let's try and figure that out. Joining us now for an exclusive interview, Jonathan Levine of Bain Capital. He founded the firm's credit business back in 1998. The business uh, now oversees $49 billion. Jonathan, great to see you. Great to here be here. In the studio. Um, we have seen a, a real shift since the beginning of the year in a number of different asset classes. Credit in some ways, and we're just kind of pointing to what Abigail just brought us, um, has seen actually a, a relatively small move. But I'm really curious as to how you see since the beginning of the year, how, how has your thinking evolved? How do you see the world differently from the 1st of January to where we are now? What is it? The 15th of February. Well, I think when you think about any kind of investing, but particularly credit investing, which at its core is lending, um, you, ha you do have to think about the long term. And do you think that there's more credit risk in the system? I think the answer to that is probably no right now. But it has gotten more expensive. The spreads have widened, still below median levels. So there could be some, some way to go. But our job is not to guess where markets are going to go. We're not in the betting business. We're in the analysis and adapting business. And I would say that when you look below the surface, there's probably some industry-specific trends we want to watch out for. As we saw in the earlier segment, reopening companies seem to be getting a, a lift right now. And some of the um, DIY, stay-at-home types of, of companies may have pulled earnings forward and people may start wondering, are they going to race to issue um, uh, debt right now on, on the heels of really, really good earnings? So our approach is industry specific, geographic specific. Um, I don't think it's an Armageddon scenario, um, as, 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 as you joked earlier, but I do think you have to be careful and watch where it's going. The second point I would make is in an, a huge percentage, more than half of the credit market is floating rate. The bank loan market and the, uh, the high yields credit markets. Yep. The bank loan market, the CLO market, the um, private lending market are largely um, floating rate. So as an owner of credit, you will be compensated as rates go up. However, obviously the interest expense that the companies you're lending to is also going to go up. And it's not surprising that rates are going up, but somehow when it happens, people are always surprised or not prepared. And that's what we're really looking at is what is the interest rate scenario that could result in companies starting to have some, some issues. But, but the moment you seem fairly sanguine that, that we're not going to see anything, let's use that word again, apocalyptic. What, if we do see a credit cycle, if we do see a kind of normal, more normal credit cycle, which it feels like we haven't had for a long time, what could that look like? How much more subdued would it be than, than normal historic cycles? Are we heading towards a recession? How could we handle that? I'm just kind of curious as to what you see in the cycle, where we are in this, this economic cycle. Are we late cycle? Uh, and how are you adapting to that? Well, when you think about most Western economies, particularly the U.S. economy, they're actually doing pretty well. You know, employment is low. There is inflation beyond a shadow of a doubt. But some of that is wage inflation. Some of that is supply chain. And those are things that will find, find an equilibrium. Then you have to look at industries because credit cycles are triggered by one of two things, a bad economic cycle or specific things in, in industries. So 08 would have been a bad economic cycle. The 15 and 16 would have been energy specific and things like that. So I think what you might see is companies that levered 
to an unusual level because they were unusually advantaged during the yeah. um, during the uh, sh the lockdown, and therefore their normalized earnings aren't right. And I think that there has been so much distortion to the upside and the downside of earnings over the last two years that figuring out what a base level is mm. is going to be the big challenge of credit investors. Well, uh, something in this credit cycle, non-cycle we have seen is that there hasn't been a lot of opportunities in distress. Do you think as rates rise, we will start to see more of that? And where might that create opportunities for you? So while there hasn't been an enormous amount of traditional distress, the special situations market, people who need bespoke capital, people who preemptively want to bring down their leverage levels or shore up their junior capital, actually has been pretty vibrant for the last couple of years. Those generally are private transactions that you don't read about. But we deployed in our special situations business globally over $3 billion last year. That said, um, rising interest rates are definitely going to put more pressure on, on companies and on their, um, and on their earnings, uh, on their interest coverage. It also, as I, as I said, we're not exactly sure what normalized earnings are across the board. And how is that going to find the appropriate equilibrium? Because I think there's just a lot of companies that borrowed too much relative to their normalized earnings. And they also borrowed a lot because rates were really low. So you put those two things together. And I think that's where distress could come from. Is, is the market functioning right now? I, I talk to, to people in the credit market fairly frequently, and I get a sense that the secondary market has become quite tricky at the moment. Um, I, I see a lot of managers, and we had a great story on this today, loading up on CDSs because they can't move their positions. Uh, and as they try and adapt, the liquidity isn't there. So, so real pricing and getting a real understanding of what is in, uh, happening in the market isn't actually there right now. What is, your, what is your assessment of liquidity and how that is impacting pricing? So I think liquidity isn't as good as it should be. I think this is a, is a perennial issue in the credit market, why it doesn't trade electronically, why it still trades on a bid-ask basis, why bank loans settle manually, all those things um, gum up the system in credit. So um, when there is not a lot of new issue, a new issue has slowed down, and people are trying to reassess the market, the bids are sometimes, um, are sometimes not as deep as you'd like to see them. The market has been way, way worse. And the good thing about the credit market is if you've made good loans, if you own good credits, then you get, an, you get interest, you get paid to wait. Yeah. So as long as you don't have to do drastic moves, you, you wait for your spot in the market. Where, where do you see ultimately the, the inflation narrative going? Where do you see the Fed going? What, what is your, you've done this for a long time, what is your read on what is happening here? So I think that inflation is something that I, I just don't think people really, really know, including the Fed, what is supply chain? What is normal increase in wages? Because for a long time, hourly wages didn't go up as much as they should have. They did not keep pace with the economy. So there is a normalization that's happening. And that's generally pretty good. That's how markets are supposed to work. So I'm not as worried if the labor market is, is inflating in some rational way. We're then looking at supply chains. And then when that settles down, then we have to understand where the real inflation is in the system so far. Um, you've seen pricing pass through. So um, people are being able to, to manage it. Wages and prices are, are keeping up. But, you know, the Fed has a big challenge in front of them because if the, they won't know if they went too fast or too slow until a year from now. And I think that's a really, really complicated task right now, more complicated than usual. And our mission is to look at it and adapt to it. Well, Jonathan, you mentioned wages going up, the competition that is out there for labor. That is true, too, within the financial industry. We've seen it time and again with, with firms trying to outdo each other when it comes to the salaries and the bonuses that they're paying. How do you at Bain view the war for talent and your position within it? Well, I think that one of the important things to um, remember is that these things, too, are cyclical. Um, for a variety of reasons, our industry is more popular and less popular. And um, I, I think that we all have to um, fish in bigger ponds, that the job of our industry is, is um, to think about how to expand who has access to our industry, where we recruit, what backgrounds we look for. Because part of the reason you get this war, on, uh, war for talent 
is honestly a lot of firms all look for the same profile, for the same 20 schools and the same backgrounds. And if we do a better job, which I think things like Zoom have enabled, at reaching more schools, at reaching more people from different backgrounds, I think that we will increase the talent pool, increase diversity, increase access. So I actually think that it will force our industry to think more broadly about who and how we hire. So you're going to be... You, this this takes us back to a conversation you and I had on stage yes. at the London School of Economics on Monday, which was fantastic. And the biggest laugh that we got, and we didn't get that many, but we got a few, <laughs> uh, was do, I, do you need an MBA? I, you, you just described the scenario in which you're looking for a more diverse, um, a, 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 a more diverse group of people. When you look at how they are educated, uh, and there's going to be people watching this program right now that are, that are looking at how they are going to progress their careers, what is the best way to progress your career right now? You know, I think one is not to jump from place to place. I think that that's often tempting, and I think um, young people tend to jump from pace, uh, place to place because it's a little easier to do now. And un I, as I've said, you never run from, uh, from something. You should go to something. Um, I think that the skill to define it better that we look for is the ability to solve problems. And you can learn how to solve business problems with more than an MBA. Um, there are other ways that you can um, find people who have the natural instinct, the, the background, and the, um, really enjoy the work to solve problems and translate it from some other industry into finance. And I think we need to um, think more about how we find more problem solvers. And if you're trying to advance your career, ask yourself, are you adding to your toolbox? Can you... Um, work on complex problems? Can you work on multiple situations at the same time? And then lastly, this is a time to reflect and know why you're doing it. Know why you want to work somewhere or pursue a particular job. Because of course the industry pays well, but if you do something just for money, at some point that's not going to be enough. And you're probably not going to be good at it if you don't have a natural interest in it. Jonathan, it was, it was great to catch up on Monday at the LSE nice event. It's been great to, to catch up today. Really enjoy spending some time with you. Thank you very much indeed for sharing some of, us, some of it with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Jonathan Levine, Bain Capital, a co-managing partner. Thank you very much indeed. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishka Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Tune in to Bloomberg's monthly series, Chief Future Officer. This episode featuring Macy's CFO Adrian Mitchell is now on Bloomberg.com and YouTube. This is Bloomberg. In case you hadn't heard, it's a time of great uncertainty, and investors are having to allocate capital in that environment. There's geopolitical risk, inflation, and a labor shortage. So where will you find the best returns? Elisa Wood, the global head of private markets and real assets product strategies at KKR, is joining us now. Elisa, when you have to put money to work, put down capital in this market, where can you do so? In this type of uncertain times, you need to own three things, and that's what we tell our investors. First and foremost, you need to invest behind inflation-protected assets, things like real estate, things like infrastructure, things that have um, asset-backed lending behind them, collateralized cash flows, things of that nature really act as a hedge in this type of environment. The second is think long-term, think, think long-term private equity, long-duration private equity. Buy assets that you can actually um, affect the value, change the value of over a long period of time and you're not playing to the short-term market wins. And thirdly, you really want to lean in to value over growth. In this type of environment for the last several years, we have really been chasing growth as a market. And that, that trade is now coming to an end. And really trying to lean into places where there are there, there is value. And that's really where you want to lean in today. Alicia, it sounds like you've got a fairly good idea of where you want to go. But the environment we're operating in at the moment is highly uncertain. How do I get optionality in that environment. If things change, how do I how do I pivot and what kind of assets do I want to own that are going to give is going to give me that optionality? Like cash is one, but what else is there out there? At the end of the day, we always like to say you only can control what you can control. And 
you want to create a foundation that you can have those pivots, as you say. So creating a strong asset allocation that has diversification in it, that you're not leaning in too heavily to a certain geography, to a certain industry, to a certain asset class is very, very important. And aside from that, you also want to be with managers that have seen this before. It's one of the things we're seeing with our clients every day where you want to invest with managers who understand how to navigate these dislocated times. We look at dislocation today and actually see it as an opportunity. We're not sitting here worried about the future. We're sitting here actually quite excited about the opportunities and the pivots, as you say, that we have ahead of us, right? One of the things that I think that's most interesting coming out of the pandemic pandemic is the is the fact that while maybe we haven't seen a pure pandemic like this before in, in this type of um, in this type of size and scale and obviously human tragedy as well, we have seen other market dislocations over time, whether it was the great financial crisis, whether it was the dot-com bubble, whether it was geopolitical events like September 11th. And investing behind managers who understand how to pivot and navigate through those cycles and have that optionality, but also diversification in their portfolios is very, very important for an environment like the one we're in today, but also that we're mm. going to be in for a number of years. Well, Elisa, just because you brought us back to the financial crisis, there was obviously a housing component in that. We may not be in a housing bubble at the moment, but the market is very, very hot right now with potentially higher rates coming and p coming quite eventually, uh, uh, aggressively potentially this year. Why do you still want to be in housing? Do you not think that potentially higher mortgage rates are going to start damping down the action we're seeing in that industry? We're actually seeing the housing market um, shift a bunch. So if you think about one of the biggest trends coming out of the pandemic, it, it's actually the trend of nesting. When you think about the number of millennials that exist today in our population the, and how they're aging, um, they need places to live. They're no longer living with their parents. So in, because of where interest rates are, they may not go buy their first home, but they may be renting their first home. So that trend is still alive and well. They need to live somewhere. When you look at the aging baby boomers, the housing trends there are also evolving. Um, as they continue to age, we're, we think senior living could be a really interesting place um, to invest and put capital today. So I would say to answer the question more directly, housing is still quite interesting. They're just pivots within the housing themes that you know maybe didn't exist a few years ago. Alisa, as, as a bottom-up granular investor, how is how are you thinking about the macro story? Do we are you starting to think about the idea, despite some of these kind of fundamental trends that are existing, that, that they could be complicated, for instance, by a significant economic slowdown? You talked about the kind of the more positive picture we certainly have at the moment, but the market's starting to worry that we could be heading for a recession. How differently would you be positioned if that were the case? Do you think a recession could be a risk on the, in terms of the horizon we should be looking at? We think there will be some type of correction over the medium term. Now, what, what is me medium term? It could be three years, it could be five years, somewhere in that period, we're expecting some type of correction. Now, we are granular investors. At the end of the day, we're investing in good companies and good assets that we can make better. That is fundamentally what we try to do. We think about the long term. We're not here to gamble. We're not here to place three months, six month, 12 month bets. We're here to invest in businesses that we will own for many, many years to come. So one of the things back to the control, what we can control, we can control management. We can control when we buy and when we sell a business, we can control what levers we pull and when we pull them to help maximize the value in that company. So if that's the perspective that we're taking over a very, very long term, um, that gives us more comfort that we will put a company, we will invest in a company, put a capital structure in place that could weather the storms that may come over this period of time and really be able to continue to drive value for our clients. When you look at the returns through dislocated markets and ones that we believe we're in today, but also ones that we expect to last for a number of years ahead of us, that's actually when we actually and others in this asset class, private equity alternatives, actually do better. We typically outperform the public markets by about five to 600 basis points on any given year in a normalized world. In a, a world that is much, much more dislocated, you could double that outperformance because of all the things I just said. You're controlling yep. what you can control. On that note, 
I will leave it. I can control that. Elisa, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Elisa Wood, KKR Global Head of Private Markets and Real Asset Product Strategies. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mitch McConnell's talking. Biden could find a better Fed nominee pick uh, than Sarah Bloom Braskin. It's going to be an interesting afternoon on the Hill. We'll provide details in a moment. This is Bloomberg.